I don't like the word spirituality because mm. it's been bandied about a lot and it's been, it's, it has so many different connotations and meanings that it annoys me sometimes when people use it. My career was going extremely well. My friendships, my relationships were going very well. They realized that I was suffering from what 80% of the city suffers, which is mild to moderate depression. When you're in pain of that kind, to be able to get even two hours of relief from something, is a large thing. If you had to ask me what my journey has been in, in this realm, it has been from being somebody who is an extreme skeptic to being somebody who is willing to accept that I may not understand it, but it could exist. Right. As opposed to if I don't understand it, it doesn't exist. I have on this podcast with me a very, very dear friend, uh, my business partner, the very, very accomplished Niranjan Ayangar, who I have known for the longest time to be a disbeliever, a non-believer. But I know that when he was going through a rough patch in his life, he did give a go to some of these modalities. And I wanted to get his perspective on it. Like I said initially, I'm not trying to propagate any modality. So it's very important to get both sides of the story. Niranjan, thank you so much for coming on to Soul Suffer with Bhav. And uh, I'm, 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 to be honest, I'm very, very scared you're going to tear me, shred me to pieces. But I thought it was very important to have you on here and talk, uh, give us your perspective so that everybody has the complete story and then they can decide what resonates with them. Thank you for having me actually. For an, uh, I mean, this kind of a program is not some, something where I expected to be invited, let alone be allowed to speak. But um, I don't think, you know, uh, Bhav, I would firstly describe myself as a non-believer. Hmm. Owing to my upbringing, my education and my surrounding and of course the time that I was born in, uh, there's a, there was a great amount of uh, respect for rules, rationality, logic and uh, emotions and feelings were while they were a very integral part of everybody's life, those were not the basis of anybody's existence. Today it's not so. Our worries are about how people are feeling. Hmm. What emotions are they going through when something is happening to them? And while those emotions are going through, if it is extremely painful or angsty for them, how is it that we will be able to assuage that, that journey, that part of the journey? And I think that is where my discovery of... Uh, I don't like the word spirituality because mm. it's been bandied about a lot and it's been, it's, it has so many different connotations and meanings that it annoys me sometimes when people use it. Um, I don't know what to call this, but this is a realm that is definitely something that has to do with your mind, with energy, with the intangible. Mm. Yeah. And for a scientific rational mind, when you're dealing with something that is intangible, which is something that you have not seen before, it's a bit difficult because there are some absolutes that you are asking me to forget. Right. As a rash person who's rational and who has a bent of mind towards mathematics or logic a lot more than anything else is um, is a bit difficult. Sorry, I'm going to cut you here. It's very it's very um, interesting that you you turned out into this rational, scientific, logical person because I know your dad. <laughs> Was a was very good at astrology. People would come to him for you know getting their charts read and all of that. Ideally, what would happen? You'd see your dad um, practice astrology. You'd become again believer, somebody who looks at it. But I also know people look at astrology as science because that's something you can prove. It's tangible. There are still the planets. How did you turn out to be this person? And you didn't take to astrology. Well, I, I, I think it was just a coincidence. Honestly, there was, there was, there was, there's no planning to this or there's no strategy or there's not even any reason for it because the entire family was into astrology. Mm. Okay. And they were uh, keen on it. And like you said, they studied it as a science much more than an occult art. Correct. 
my uncle, my father's elder brother, was a very accomplished astrologer in Chennai. So it used to be as funny as they are fighting with each other, the two brothers. And suddenly he say, "You, my my dad's uh, elder brother is telling my dad that you will never understand it. Your fifth house has Shani. You are a dumb person." But what it did to me specifically was that I understood, or somewhere I made this equation. That if you have to call somebody a dumb person, then not only do you need to have a solid reason for calling them that, the more scientific the reason, the better it is. What I did find uh, odd and why I dismissed this part of life or this part of what people found great solace in was. Because nobody was able to explain it to me in the way like this. Hmm. Like I believe in astrology, and because of which I say that fifth house is shani hai, so your brains are dumb. Hmm. Not that it's true. There are many other combinations that come, but I'm just saying these are the conversations right. I've grown up with. The family was a little bit more academic in its bent, so we always looked at science or logic or rationality for answers. Hmm. It's very rarely that you turn to something that was esoteric or metaphysical. to find answers so how did you do that because i know i know you turned to uh, the esoteric modality of uh, theta healing how did that turn around happen in your head see a human being needs all kinds of support to grow fully <clears throat> in my case the rationality the logic the science was very much a part of my upbringing but i also had another advantage because i had an artistic bent of mind because even when i'm writing a song or a dialogue or a story or a, anything that i'm doing or i'm acting in a play i know that there is a certain suspension of disbelief i know that there are certain things that i'm doing where i don't have the backing of science i don't have the backing of any logic or rational but i'm able to enter that realm and create whatever mm-hmm. so somewhere you have a vague idea that when you enter the artistic field science and logic and rational does take a step back mm. and you must allow it to take a step back if you really truly want to be creative right i had very smartly and very conveniently and very comfortably demarcated my life into these two areas wherever i want to be illogical and irrational i go into arts whenever i want to whenever i am in real life i am scientific and logical and rational was going very well for a very long time i think it changed in 2013 mm-hmm. around 2012 2013 my career was going extremely well my friendships my relationships were going very well something was niggling me inside saying that you know it's all going very well but something is off i don't know what that feeling was it was just a feeling it was just a uh, instinct and i've always been somebody who picked up on these instincts so i picked up on the instincts that i took steps to deal with it and i realized that i was suffering from what 80% of the city suffers which is mild to moderate depression so then my journey began into trying to figure out what i went to a psychiatrist i did my uh, counseling sessions i was trying virtually everything that came my way so at that point in time because my angst and my pain and my depression and my entire interest in the life force that was within myself was waning rapidly and i knew very strongly that i needed to do something i didn't know what it was during that time ryan was had just started doing some healings with tanuja and tanuja does used to do theta yeah, healing tanuja used to do theta healing So I went to her and I remember we did the first session in the Marriott. It was a very weird thing because I never went to her house, and it was never a formal session. I met her at the Marriott in the coffee shop. I must say this was like a high <laughs> high society healing session. Yeah. So I went to Marriott. We were sitting in the coffee shop. We were talking, and I told her this is what I'm feeling and all. And I still remember very clearly. She said, "Close your eyes." I closed my eyes, and then she took a pen, which she had, which was a ballpoint pen. and she told me to open my eyes and she just moved the pen in various directions or around my face and just said that with your eyeball just follow where the pen is going that's all you need to do mm. of course in my head i'm thinking what is this i mean you know i hope no one shooting this because this looks really silly but anyway i did it i went through it and uh, she did that and after that she asked me how are you feeling and i said yeah i am feeling the same it's not uh, and about 10 15 minutes after the session i remember feeling extremely exhausted like i was sleepy like my eyes were drooping 
So I told her I'm going and so she said yeah, yeah okay. There was no conversation about whether it had an impact, whether there was any change, whatever. I left, I sat in the car, I was extremely sleepy. I told my driver take me home. Reached home, went upstairs in the elevator, rang the bell and I still remember this moment Bhav. The moment I rang the bell, you know how you hear the bell from outside the door that is yeah. rung inside yeah. but you hear it from outside. That hearing of the bell, in that very instant, there was some kind of, call it static, call it electricity, call it energy, call it spark, whatever you choose to call it. From the sole of my feet, I could see something travelling right up to my head. Now, it could be nerve reaction, I don't know what it was, but it woke me up completely. I was so sleepy till then. It woke me up and in that moment, I lost something in my head, which I don't know what it is. But I was very aware that something had gone. Hmm. Something was lifted. Something had separated from, and it gave me immense relief. So today, if you have to think back, go back to that moment, what is that something? Have you been able to? I have no idea. I still have no idea what that phenomenon was. I can't explain it in any scientific or rational or logical way. Bhav, I didn't even give it that much thought. Hmm. But what I do realize is that taking away of that particular thing really, really relieved me of something. So when I thought about that, I said, oh, so there is clearly something that can't be explained, but is possible. Right. Now when something that cannot be explained, but is possible, it instantly falls into the realm of belief. Yeah. Okay, when you say that I believe it, but I can't explain it, that means it's a belief. Also, it opens a lot of doors. Yeah. My understanding and my arriving at where I am today, vis-a-vis -vis this, is I think somewhere the journey of the world. Yeah. The journey of the world is also from a binary to be able to say that it's not just these two or three or five things that exist. There could be things that are in between. And if those in-between things are things that can help you in some way mm. to navigate the course of a difficult journey, mm. we should do that. So I'm going to filter down from the journey of the world back to your journey. And I'm going to bring this up because I, I, and I know it's very uncomfortable. I know after Ryan and Dory crossed over, you had a really, I would say we had a really uh, tough run. And I know that there was a point where you had tried everything and for the first time I heard you say it out loud that I think I need help. I want to hear about that journey. By the time Ryan passed and after that about 6-8 months later Dory passed, um, by then I was already doing a lot of stuff. Mm. The first thing that I tried was Theta Healing mm. and mind you, I, did, I have done Theta Healing, I have done Buddhist chanting. I have done uh, Wim Hof's breathing exercises, I have done um, uh, NLP, mm. I have done um, clinical psychiatry, I have done acupuncture mm. and I had seen that Buddhist chants had helped me up to a point mm. and uh, uh, even NLP had helped me to a point. When I say helped me, I don't mean uh, that they cured me of whatever I was going through or that it was some some uh, really joyful experience. They gave you the tools? It gave me insight. Mm. For instance, when I did NLP, I remember this very clearly. When I did NLP, it gave me a breakthrough into something in my childhood, which explained my personality to me. Right. It was more psychiatric, it was more scientific even within that than, uh, you know, uh, in that sense, uh, esoteric. So, okay, so for our audience, NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming, yes. which is, we have covered that in an episode. In an episode. So. In an episode. So, that is what you have tried as well. I tried that and suffice to say that it was something that made me realize that none of this should be looked upon as curative. Mm. This is not a cure for anything. Just like there are some things that you go to a doctor for and not always does it get fully cured in the moment. Mm. So it's, a, it's a treatment. Some treatments work, some treatments don't work. Sometimes people try allopathy, it doesn't work for them. They go to homeopathy and it works fine. So I'll be very honest with you, Niranjan. When I started channeling, 
I was very conscious about the fact that I'm sitting next to somebody who has a very strong opinion. I wouldn't call it judgment. You had a very strong opinion about these modalities. And what I was tapping into and practicing every single day next to you was uh, something that couldn't be explained. Even I couldn't explain it. So I co wouldn't uh, expect anybody else to explain it. What was going on in your head in that very moment because you were, again, you were in contact with that person which was completely contrasting to your beliefs. So what was going on? Definitely it was very surprising. It was very, very astonishing for me on many levels. Uh, but I had heard these experiences with other people. They had told me about these experiences and they were people who I trusted. Mm. And like I said, Bhav, in my head, um, my uh, opinions or my, my thinking against any of these modalities had a lot to do with my ideological beliefs. Right. But as a human being, I have always believed that yes, there is a certain ideological similarity that you need to have with people who you were meeting or interacting or living or having a relationship with of any kind. You needn't, ha you needn't have a hundred percent congruence to their beliefs. I always believed that. I have always had friends whose belief systems in many areas of life was exactly the opposite of mine. So when you started the process of channeling and that writing, there were parts of your writing which came from nowhere close to any of your background. Like, like you gave the example of quantum physics. What you wrote about quantum physics or the kind of uh, theory that you were propagating in that two paragraphs was something that books in quantum physics write about. It's something that YouTube and I knew for a fact that quantum physics as a subject matter was not at all interesting or inspiring I didn't, for to you. To be honest, I didn't even know it existed. Exactly. So you didn't know what it was and yet you were drawing diagrams, you were, you were writing scientific concepts. I mean, I, I, it was a mystery to me, especially when that continued, not for one day, two day, ten days. You wrote that journal for 365 to 380 days. And I was there throughout and out of those 365 days, I think about 100 days you must have read out the stuff to me. Yeah. It was fascinating for me that, oh, so this is not as personal as I had imagined. Because in my head what it was was that, okay, when you are in pain, you hold on to certain things as, as painkillers, let's put it that way. But painkillers job necessarily is to assuage your pain, nothing more. So if these writings were purely emotional from your end and if they were just about moving on, progressing in life, getting a sense of what my life is after my loss and grief, then I would have been very clear that this is a completely emotional response to what is happening to you. But strangely, that was not the only thing you were writing about. Yeah. While you were writing about what was going on in your heart and your head and your soul, you were writing about things that did not concern the circumstances but had to do with the world at large. Yeah, I think I remember writing about dimensions, frequencies, vibrations. It was just, and I was like, where is this coming from? And, and there was also a large part of it, if I remember right, I don't remember the exact words, but I remember a large part of your journaling was also about human relationships. Mm. About how do how, how do we perceive certain how do we perceive fear, how do we perceive anxiety, how do we perceive mm. depression, what it is ha that happens exactly when we shun parts of ourselves. Yeah. These are not things that had to do directly with the incident or the loss that we were yeah. going through. Mm. It had to do with larger human construction. That I'm very intrigued as a person. I'm going to come back to your journey and I'm going to take you to uh, the point where you came to me one day and said, I'm trying pranic healing and I've, uh, I've met somebody and you actually told me that it worked for you to a certain degree. Yes, it did. And now I want to know what, 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 is, what was your experience of pranic healing? Normally also when, when I take medicines for instance of any kind, whether it's an allopathic medicine, well, why read up about it before taking it? And when I read up, I know what it is supposed to cure, which part of my body... Sorry, I'm <laughs> laughing because you only you don't read up, all your friends have to hear about what you have read up. You'll be like, hello, I've heard this and this is what happens. So, so I'm that person. So, so you know, I always know when I take anything to... Uh, feel better about anything about my life, physical or mental. I always um, 
feel that uh, I read about it, I study it, I also make notes about how what difference is making in which part of my body and I know that if I've taken a tablet for backache and suddenly my head starts aching I will note that so I said oh I took a pill for backache but my headache has aggravated that's the kind of person I am so I did the same thing here also uh, but the only thing that really surprised me about pranic healing was that I really didn't have to do anything Unlike the other modalities that I had tried. Other modalities made me participate. Mm. If I was doing Buddhist chants, I had to sit down and chant. If I was doing Wim Hof technique, I had to sit down and breathe and do stuff. This was the first modality where firstly Gita was not even in the same town that I was. She lives in Bangalore, I am in Bombay. Our only interaction was on the phone. Right. When I spoke to her also, strangely unlike the other healing techniques that I used, I never had to give her too much of my background. I had to just tell her that I'm going through loss and grief right now. One of my closest friends who I considered my soulmate who was just beyond my close friend has passed away. And within six months, Dory, who had who I had also given so much of, uh, invested so much in her, she also passed away one after the other and it was a double whammy in many ways for me. And when she spoke back to me, her only thing was, by 8 o'clock in the morning, take a shower. <laughs> and then she of course put me on to bark flower therapy. So there were these drops that I had to put in 500 ml of water and throughout the day just have sips every hour. That's all I did. And yet, there was a remarkable difference within 10 days of her starting this. And let me tell you, uh, Bhav, the remarkable difference was not my skin started glowing, my hair started looking nice or that I was suddenly bouncing off the walls with a lot of energy. What I realized about that was it was slowly but surely through me only, through my own mind, was dismantling my idea of life itself. Mm. If I have to really simplify it, I would say that all my life, I was going through a certain operating system. That's how I was. And suddenly this new software, which was introduced into the system, made me realize that, oh my God, I was looking at everything in life from the operating system that I had followed. And I had dismissed any new operating system because I said this is working so why should I change mm. it. And when it didn't work for me, I tried something else and I realized, oh my god, this is pretty convenient, this is pretty comfortable, this is pretty uh, calming. If you had to ask me what my journey has been in, in this realm, it has been from being somebody who is an extreme skeptic. Mm to uh, being somebody who is more accepting, more forthcoming and is willing to accept that I may not understand it, but it could exist. Right. As opposed to if I don't understand it, it doesn't exist. When people listen to podcasts like these, somewhere you are recalibrating the way they look at life, their prism of life. What is your hope for this podcast? My hope for this podcast is I am hoping that even if it... Uh, manages to uh, infuse what it has infused in me. Which is? Uh, which is uh, from being completely dismissive of it to at least reach a space where I am um, where, where I am ready to accept it as a system and I am ready to uh, engage with it in a way that I think is rational and logical and uh, look for meaning in it. I may or may not find meaning. Tomorrow, two years down the line, after this path, I might say, ke, Bhav, I tried everything, but I don't think I can believe in it. Or then I say, ke, Bhav, I tried it for so many years, I think it's become such an integral part of my life that I am now a believer. Right. Either of these three, two things can happen. But I am on that journey. Right. And I think if, if, I, if we, through this podcast, can even make people aware that this is an alternative. You may choose to use it or you may not choose to use it. But it's there. Yeah, it's there for people because when you're in pain Bhav, and that is something that is my personal experience when you're in pain of that kind when you're having an angst of that kind to to be able to get even two hours of relief from something is a large thing yeah so if even if this these modalities whatever they are and whatever each person wants to do, if it can help them that much it is still a great help because it helped me a lot. Honestly, I look at your soul suffer from, at this point, from rigidity to 
acceptance to flexibility and flexibility is a great space to be in we don't know what is Absolutely. going to be here on out but i'm sure it's going to be exciting i agree with you I'm because be here <laughs> right next to you figuring out what the next step of your journey is going to be but yeah yeah like i said when you just said that it occurred to me what i'm trying to say if i have to say it in one line is that my soul suffer s u f f e r has turned into suffer the journey yeah you know from that and that is what it is for me yeah and and journey is not a destination i don't know where i'll reach with this journey yeah. but i'm on this journey and even that has been um illuminating enough for me and i'm hoping i'll be able to share the next part of my journey in the in season 4 of this podcast perhaps <laughs> yeah yeah it will it will thank you so much niranjan it's it's great to sit across somebody who doesn't subscribe blindly that is great and thank you for coming on board uh, on this on this episode of the podcast and sharing your views with me thank, thank you, you so thank much. you for having me on this podcast because i think there are there are a lot of people like me yeah and uh, there may be some extreme people who might even be making fun of all this i just feel everybody has a place they, on their table yeah and also i just feel even if they decide to dismiss it after watching this entire podcast it will still be something for them to have heard it yeah I agree with you completely. Yeah. Thank you Niranjan. Thank you, thank you Bhav. Any creator needs your love and support to grow and reach a larger audience. And that is why I would request you to like, share, subscribe and comment on the video below because well, you don't know who's going to benefit from this content. Also, please don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you get notified every time we drop a new video. We also upload our podcast on Spotify so you can hear them as smaller chapters in your own time at home.